everybody. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand praise. I thank God for allowing me to be here today. Hallelujah. This, um, our speaker, I'm going to introduce you. I've known you, like I saw you around, I got saved when I was 18, and then you see people that, you're, that are your own age, young people. I was talking to them about the, the councils. So I've known you around. I've ta I haven't talked to you per se back in the younger days, obviously, because I was married, but my friends kind of had a little crush on him. But, <laughs> um, but uh, Elder Slaughter, when I first heard you speak, when I first heard you speak, you were talking about walking in your purpose. I think you spoke in Jackson. Yep. And, like, I hear a lot of speakers, but I know I was like, man, that was deep stuff, and I still remember that. I don't know how many years ago that was, but you are, like, you, he's an awesome speaker. I'm excited that he, he agreed to speak for us. He's our Northern District Council president, and I get to be in the meeting sometimes and, and the retreat. I'm so excited. We have young people. We have something good coming on the retreat. I've been telling you, um, I'm so excited to be able to work with you. Um, and, and I work with your, your father in the treasury, so I think, uh, praise God, that you uh, accepted our, our speaking invitation. But at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Elder Jonathan Slaughter. Let's scream with a hearty amen. amen. Let's say preach. <laughs> preach the word. Amen. We say praise the Lord to everyone. Praise the Lord. Now, I didn't ask anybody to repeat me. I was hoping you would follow instructions and do that because he's been a good God to us. Amen. So I'm going to try it again and see if I get the right proper response. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Oh, he's been better than that. Didn't he wake you up this morning? Praise the Lord, everyone. Lord. Didn't he save you? Praise the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'll sing a song. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Well, it's in the name of Jesus, precious name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call on his his name is jesus says us jesus we have the victor come on church help me sing it in the name of jesus in the name of jesus we have the victory in the name of jesus precious name of jesus Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call on his great. His name is Jesus, Jesus. I love Jesus. We have the vid. It's Friday, and since we at church, we might as well lift him up, right? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, help me sing it. In the name of Jesus, precious name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call on his great. His name is Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, we have the victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God. Come on, church, let's thank God. The world is dying, but we're living. I said, let's thank God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank God for, for God. And I thank God that I know to thank him and nobody else. For it's in him that I live, I move, and have my being. He's the only kind of God that can look beyond my faults and see my needs. He's the only kind of God that even when I'm in my foolish state, his grace is sufficient to cause a change in my life. He loved me so much that he didn't just give me instructions to live holy, but he gave me a spirit that helps me live right. I wish I had help in here. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest any man or any woman should boast. And so my, my gratitude tonight and my thankful tonight is in Jesus Christ and him alone. 
You know, when, as soon as I came in to the church, I almost made a detour downstairs because I smelled something that was smelling mighty good. <laughs> and I almost wanted to say, uh, come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord. What's going on in the basement? <laughs> and I don't know what they're planning, what they're doing, but the Lord knows that bread of heaven here can feed me till I want no more. And as you can see, I'm, I'm happy in Jesus tonight. And some of you, if I were to ask you, do you have the joy of the Lord? You would say yes. But I was hoping that you would notify your face that you're happy so you would smile at me and look a little bit better. I've never seen so many sanctified, sad folks in my life. But if we're happy and we've got the answer for the world, and that answer is in Jesus Christ. I don't want your Savior if he can't make you smile when nothing's funny. I don't want your Savior if, if, if you can't cry when he ain't even sad. He's just that good to me. Sometimes I'm in Walmart and I'm looking for the next detergent to get in my hands to just slip up and I'll just remember how good he's been. And they want to call the psychologist and say, we got a crazy man on aisle three. I tell them, I ain't crazy. I'm crazy. You're right. I am crazy. I'm crazy about Jesus. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and I don't know how y'all do it, because I know y'all think of all he's done. But if I think of everything, I lose my mind up here. But if I just think of what he did last week, when he kept my car on the road, when I think of what he did just a few months ago and brought my father out of a hospital, on a sick bed, I, I just, I just think of his goodness. Even on a Friday night, when the world is looking to sin, I'm looking to praise him. I wish I had help in here. Somebody got their Sunday meal on their mind, trying to think what to, how long to keep the roast in the oven tonight. But I'm, I'm glad that I'm thinking of how long I can stay in the body of Christ. And so I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm certainly thankful for the invitation of such a unworthy candidate like myself to come and stand in the sacred desk to speak to such distinguished people, people who are the elect of God. And so we thank God tonight for the angel and under shepherd of this house, Pastor David Johnson, and to his companion, and to all of you who are somebody to Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. Thank God for you, because God loved you enough to see fit to wake you up and bring you into this house of worship tonight. I thank God for Sister Ashley and this invitation. She could have called more capable people than me, but yet the lot fell on me tonight to say something to inspire, empower, inform somebody to go another day's journey. And so that's why we're here tonight. I'm not a shouting preacher. I'm not a hang on the chandeliers kind of preacher because I realize after you come down from the chandelier, you gotta be able to live something. And I realize after the shaking and quaking, if you don't have the real deal, Holy Ghost, you can't live anything. And you're not sealed until the day of Jesus Christ. And I realize as I'm traveling across this state, going to different youth services from Port Huron to Niles, from Albion to Paw Paw, to Flint, to Bay City, to Burton, to Detroit, to Ypsilanti, to Grand Rapids. I'm traveling all across the state. And I realize that in these days, people have itching ears, but then there are some people whose life is, is, is in such critical condition that a preacher ought not stand before God's people and tickle people's fancies. But we ought to come with the true, uncontaminated, unadulterated word of God because that's the only thing that's going to last in these evil days and I understand that that's not popular and I understand many people will never call me to come stand in their pulpit but that's all right because I'm not their preacher I'm God's preacher and I'll say what the Lord has commanded me to say and if I forget a pat on the back or a kick in the back God's got my back and so I'll be quite all right. And I realize that even with our young people, oftentimes we overlook the pains and perils of our young people because we say they're just kids. But I want us to know that 
Young people have storms and tribulations too. Young people have pains and hurts too. Young people have issues and situations too. One of my employee's daughters within the last month committed suicide because she felt the issues that were in her life were too much to bear. And I realized that when young people commit suicide, they really don't want to die. They just want death to their situation. And so when we come into the house of God, we ought not play around. And in fact, when we have youth services, I know many times, I'm, I'm not fussing, I'm just, I'm talking about the church next door. But I know that when we have youth services, I ought to expect more adults to support our young people. Because they're not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And if we don't show them love, but yet all we show them is correction, then soon there'll be rejection. And so we must encourage them. And I tell you, some of the seasoned saints at the church at home, I say, don't whoop them if you won't help them. Don't correct me if you can't bless me. And so we want to show them love. And I realize I was a youth pastor for about 10 years at a church in Detroit under the late, great Suffolk Bishop Lockhart. And in my youth interactions, it was to my surprise, Sister Ashley, that there were some young people, and I didn't know at the time, that whenever we had youth services, they were there as soon as service started. And they would be there to the very end. And when we had lock-in services, they would be there all night long. And, I, and, and I'm thinking, maybe that good programming. They love being in church. And so I had to ask them. I, sometimes I would stop them and say, what is it about the youth ministry that you really love so much? And they say, Elder John, I have to be honest. I, it, I love coming to church, but I got so many situations at home, I'd rather be here than at home. I let that sit in your lap for a moment because I'm talking to some people tonight that are so glad that they're at church and not at home dealing with some frustrations. Some of our young people, don't, we don't even know it, but the only time they have peace and don't have to worry about being molested or abused is when they're at church and not at home. And so when we come into this sacred assembly of ourselves, let us make sure we come with the mind to give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Have I got a witness in here tonight? Amen. Tonight I want to talk to you from the book of First Peter, chapter number 2. I promise that if... Now, I've had the privilege of speaking in several types of churches seven different denominations. I've been privileged to preach, of course, in the Apostolic Church and African Methodist, Episcopal, Catholic, Baptist. But I'll tell you all a secret, but don't tell nobody. My favorite kind of church to preach in is a talk back to me church of the Apostolic faith. <laughs> so I want you all to talk to me tonight. If I say something that you know is true, say amen. If I say something that ain't true, say, help him, Lord. Yeah. But just make sure y'all talk back to me tonight so I know I'm not in here by myself. Is that all right? Yeah. I'm glad I see some pearly whites now. I know I'm in the sanctified church. Some of you ain't smiled all week, but we're going to get there after a while. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is a word from the Lord in the house tonight. And I believe that before we leave tonight, somebody will say, it was good for me to have been here. Is that all right? In the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2, uh, let's read um, verses 7, 8, and 9. It says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but to them which be disobedient, stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And then, of course, First Peter chapter number 2, verse number 9 says, but 
you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The theme that was given to me on the invitation was dealing with the walking dead. And as I pondered and meditated over that, in lieu of the current state of affairs in our world and in our communities, I want to use a theme for tonight that eternal lives matter. Eternal lives matter. Eternal lives matter. Most of you in here tonight, you are aware, you are conscious if you pay attention to the lazy tube, I'm sorry, the television. And if you watch it, you know that we are in the midst of a democratic process called election season. And there are several candidates that falls into different categories called Democrats and others are called Republicans and they are seeking your vote in the attempts and hopes that one day they can become the president of the United Snakes, I'm sorry, States of America. We have some very vibrant characters. We have some very quiet. We have some men. We have a woman. And they're all trying to get everybody to be on their side. And they're trying to prove to everybody that they're believable and trustworthy and that they can get the job done. As we watch this process, I wonder how many of us have given God that much attention in our own lives that he can get the job done for us. They're all trying to get your approval. They all are trying to get you to make a choice for them that they can then make choices that affect you. And it's mighty interesting, before I dive into the text in First Peter, and the fact that while they are trying to get your approval, they are also trying to stop you from approving of somebody else. And it's mighty interesting that during this process, while they want you to vote for them, they also don't want you to vote for somebody else. So while they tell you all the good things about themselves, they're trying to tell you the bad things about somebody else. And I realize that as I watch these debates that I know some Christians like that. Help me, Holy Ghost. I got to get back safely. But there are some Christians that in the attempt to try to make themselves look good to you, they got to tear down somebody else. And the only issue with that is the fact that not only do Christians see this, but non-believers see how we conduct ourselves. The Bible says that we are living epistles. And sometimes the only Jesus that people will see is the Jesus that you live in your life. Some people will never crack open the Bible. Some people will never step foot in the church. But you can take Jesus to them in the life that you live. And in this mean and cruel world, the world is looking for a solution to its problems. And I'm not using the pulpit to tell you who to vote for, but I can tell you one thing. People won't change so bad that they're willing to follow somebody who will disrespect them and mislead them. I thought I heard somebody say Donald Trump. No, okay. But people are willing to do things because you won't change so bad. And that lets me know that sometimes you can be so desperate for a change that you will do anything. 
And the Bible says that God says that he'll have a remnant that'll seek him, for this is the generation that seeks him. And we have to want to change from God so bad that we'll be willing to do anything. And I don't know about you all here, but the people I encounter need a change in their lives. People are struggling, people are hurting, people are dying and looking for an answer. And we as children of God have to care about them so much that we'll be willing to do anything to cause them to see Jesus. And while we go around and trying to find different solutions to people's problems, I'm still convinced and fully, fully persuaded that Jesus is the answer. There's no job too big, no job too small. Jesus is the answer for the world's condition. So then the question is, who are the people that are going to represent Jesus in the world? That's why I gave you the premise tonight, just for thematic thrust, that eternal lives matter. In the state of the affairs, there are many movements going on now due to the conditions in our world, due to the disenfranchisement of African Americans, many people have come together in a group started in 2012 called the Black Lives Matter movement, a movement to galvanize and call to action a group of people to fight the injustices against the people. In rebuttal, in refute to that, there's another movement that was started called Blue Lives Matter, where law enforcement said our lives matters too, for we have the due diligence of going out into the community and setting ourselves up against ambushments and dangers to protect you all who are saying we are endangering you. And in all these movements where they're calling lives matter, I'm here to tell the world none of that matters. The only true thing that really matters is eternal lives matter. Because if you don't have eternal life, then nothing you do matters at all. I wish I was in an apostolic church. There's many people sitting in our pews, and it doesn't matter who you are, your color of your skin, or nationality. If you don't have eternal life, then nothing else matters. And until you get Jesus as your Savior, it'll never get better for you. Until Jesus is your Lord and your King, it'll never get better for you. And so the people who have eternal life are now have a responsibility to share this Jesus Christ to the world. Why is the world so dark? Because the people who walk in light ain't letting their light shine. Because when I go to some churches, I don't know if I'm at a club or a church. I can't tell between the music saying it's gospel music, but I ain't heard you say Jesus nowhere in the song. Saying that you love his name, but I ain't heard you say his name or oh, service. How can you come in God's house and not acknowledge him in the beginning? I dare you to come to my house, open my door, sit on my couch, go in my refrigerator, kick off your shoes and relax your feet, fold your arms, sit on my couch. Go to sleep and leave without knocking on the ring, ringing the doorbell or knocking on the door and saying, Brother John, can I come in? But we do that to God every Sunday. I heard somebody say one day, come on, let's give God praise and let's usher God into the sanctuary. I said, excuse me. You can't invite God into his own house. I wish I had help in here. I don't give God praise so he can come into the atmosphere. I'm glad when they say unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. It's God's house in the first place. I'm just glad that he saw fit to let me in. Because it didn't have to be this way. Instead of standing at a pulpit, I can be standing in front of a judge. Instead of standing in the pulpit, I can be standing on the corner. Instead of standing 
speaking the words of life. I can be speaking words of hate and division in my home. And I know you've been sanctified and you, you were smart enough to believe the gospel. But if you're like me, it was no goodness of my own. But he saw fit to draw me to him when I didn't want to draw him to myself. So in First Peter, because I got to leave you alone. I promise if you talk back to me, I'll be done by three in the morning. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, says, Unto you therefore which believe, he's precious. And I'm just wondering, is God precious to anybody in here tonight? Is he so precious that you'll tell of his goodness everywhere you go? Is he so precious that you abide by his rules and his statutes? Is he so precious that you won't wait till you need him to call his name, but you'll call his name even when you don't need anything just to let him be familiar with your voice? Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but to them which be disobedient. Uh Uh-oh. All the disobedient, I know all the disobedient people are sitting on the fourth row. Nobody's on it. Don't worry. (laughs) But to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. Verse 8, and the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, stop, hold the music. Because if you look at this verse and its context, you'll understand something very dangerous. The Bible says to them which believe he's precious. But to them which be disobedient, the same one that's precious is now a stone of stumbling. Uh Uh-oh. Because if the solution to everything is Jesus, when you believe he's precious, but when you're disobedient, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, where will you get your help when the one that needs to help you is causing your problems? Some folks are praying that God deliver them and God said, I'm the one that gave you that trouble because you're disobedient. Some of us are praying that God ease the burden and God said, "Uh, you do know I sent that burden, right? Some of us are saying, God, take this thorn from my flesh. He said, I'm the one that, but what do you do when your grief is coming from God? What do you do when your suffering is coming from the Savior? What do you do when your pain is coming from paradise? What do you do when your hurt is coming from heaven? Tell your neighbor you better start obeying. (laughs) Because when you're obedient, he's precious to you. The Bible goes on as I leave you alone. Gives you four points and I'll leave you alone, I promise, because I want to let you know that eternal lives truly matter. In verse number nine, it says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Four things that I know about you that you didn't know I knew about you. Because if you are a believer, if you are sanctified, blood bought, blood washed, if Jesus is not just your Lord but your Savior, if he's your Christ, if he's your everything, then there's some things I know about you without looking at your Facebook account. There's some things I know about you without going into your cell phone and looking at your text messages. I know some things because I looked at the greatest text message ever sent, the Bible. says, you're a chosen generation. And as I was teaching this verse one time, I remember asking a group of young people in verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, what do you think is the most important word in this verse? If I was to ask these Bible scholars over here, one of them would probably say, I know, brother preacher. I say, tell me, kind sir. They say, uh, but royal priesthood. 
I say, woo, talking good, Reverend. Yeah. I said, tell me why. They said, because the royal lets me know that I'm in the kingdom of God and I'm one of God's dearly beloved children. I'm a king's kid. Any king's kids in here? Anybody in the royal family of Christ? Well, as good as that is, I have to say sorry. That's not it. If I was asked another one of these great Bible scholars over here, one of them probably say, uh, chosen generation. Chosen. I say, woo! You're talking good, Reverend. I say, tell me what you mean. He said, because we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Let's me know that God selected me with his great godly counsel. He picked me before the world was. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, he already knew me and whom he foreknew, he predestined, whom he predestined, he called and whom he justified, he glorified, who he glorified had to be sanctified. And one day it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, because I'm chosen in him. I say, woo-wee, talking good, reverend. But that ain't it. If I was to ask one of these Bible scholars on the front row right here, I say, what do you think is the most important word? Another one would probably say, holy. I have to get ready to cut her up. Because we don't talk about holiness anymore. Holiness had me kicked out of a few people churches. Talking about holiness made a few people say, we don't bring him back because he's talking about my stuff. I got to get myself together. But I want to say anybody that know that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I know it's not popular, but I'm glad I don't need to be paid to preach the gospel. And I can tell the truth no matter the consequence that you must be holy because God is holy. You can't do anything. You can't say anything. You can't be anything. You can't think anything. But present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Before you get a new car, get a new mind. Before you go get a new house, make sure you get a new mind. Otherwise, you're bringing the old junk into a new house and there's still going to be confusion. Somebody been writing stuff in my notes. That wasn't in there when I got here. <laughs> Holy, and I say, thank you, Jesus Christ. But that's not it. If I could just submit to you, this is slaughterology. If I could just submit to you tonight, Dr. Morrow, I believe the most important word in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, of all the things it says about us is a very small word. Some of you got it already. It's the very first word. But. But. Because if you look before that conjunction, the conjunction but, for all of you English majors, you know that that's a change of thought or change of thinking from the speaker's intentional or original intent. In other words, while they were saying one thing, they wanted you to know I'm now giving new direction or new information. Before the word but, it tells you that for those who were disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed, there are some people who were disobedient. And all of us in here were disobedient. But there was a moment where a wonderful change took place in our life. When God disrobed himself of his glory, came down through 42 human generations, still God and still man at the same time and became the sacrificial lamb for us and hung on an old rugged cross. They pierced him in his hands and they pierced him in his side and they pierced him in his feet and they plucked out his beard and they beat him so much where he couldn't even recognize who he was and his back looked like a plowed field beaten with a cat of nine tails and he took all of that abuse for us because he wanted us to be what he called us to be. Yeah. 
Sometimes we got to just remember why we have eternal life. But he wanted us so bad and he wanted that change so bad so that on the other side of the but why it was my past, he has given me the newness of life. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Forgetting those things which are behind me and looking to those things which are before me, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you all, but you can remember what I did, but I'm so glad that God cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. And even though I have attained and stained past, I'm looking unto Jesus, who's the author and finisher of my faith. And there's no mistake that you can make that so grand or large that God's grace can't forgive you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who told you you got to be a slave to sin? Who told you you couldn't live right? Who told you that you couldn't make a difference in this world bigger than your community, but you can make an impact to the kingdom of God? As I leave you alone, it says that ye are a chosen generation. A chosen generation. I wonder if anybody knows how significant that word chosen is. I wonder if you realize how special you are in Christ. That's why eternal lives matter, because it's proof that God loves you very dearly. Because if God chose you, it means he had other options. If we were to go down the street and we were all in the church van and y'all said, let's get something to eat. And the only restaurant we saw was the McDonald's around the corner and we went there and got something to eat, we'd still, even though we went there, we didn't choose to go to McDonald's. We decided to go to McDonald's. But if we go around the other corner and there's a McDonald's, a Steak and Shake, and a Wendy's, and I say, let's go to McDonald's, and y'all say, okay. Then, not only did we decide to go, but we chose to go to McDonald's. Why? Because you only can make a choice when you got other options. The Bible says, but you are a chosen generation. That means that God had other options, but he still decided to save you. If that ain't enough reason for you to get yourself together, then I don't know what it's going to take. Because that means that while you went here tonight, it didn't have to be that way. You could still have a mind to sin. You can still be a slave to darkness. You ain't did nothing that good. I know, I know, I know you're saved and you got sanctified clothes on, but your righteousness is still like a filthy rag. The only reason we can come in here is because of his goodness. The only reason we can come in here is because of his grace and his mercy. You ain't that special. It's because of God and God alone. So when I come in here, I just want to say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your power. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of us got to get, got to have to get some humble pie. Because we tell people to give God the glory and we sit here like this, like you special. Then God, when God knock you upside your head and you roll up in here in a wheelchair, then you want to lift your hands. No, baby. Do it right now while you got a chance. Do it right now while you got the strength. Do it right now while you can think of his goodness and his mercy. Hallelujah. Says we're a chosen generation. 
You ain't in here because it's church night. You in here because God so fit to order your steps in his word. You ain't that smart to believe the gospel. The gospel was so smart it came and grabbed you out of the darkness of sin. Please be seated. You'll make me nervous. It says, but you are chosen generation. That's, that's what I, I want you to know that, that he had other options, but he picked you. Got that down. That's chosen. We're 25% of the way there. Then the other one says, uh, uh, we are royal priesthood. Now, I know there's this notion going around that we can decree and declare things and speak things that are not as though we were. But can I help somebody at this supper table? The Bible says we are royal priesthood. Two words there that let us know some things about ourselves. Number one, it says we're part of the priesthood. Now, if you look in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll realize in verse number one that the, 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 the chief privilege of a priest is they had access into the holies of holies once a year. And once a year, they would go into the holy of holies and offer atonement and sacrifice for the sins of the people with his lamb without a spot or wrinkle on him. And they would go in once a year and the priest would have a rope tied around him just in case God didn't receive the sacrifice. Because you couldn't come in his presence incorrect. Take notes. Remember that. Think about that later on. But you can't come in his presence any kind of way. And just in case the priest came in God's presence improper, he would be struck dead. And, and they wouldn't know whether he was in there still praying, still talking, or dead. If they didn't hear the bells on his skirts of his wardrobe, they would think he was dead. And they would tug on the rope. And if the priest tugged back, they know he's still alive. But they tug it to get a pull, they would have to pull him out because they couldn't go in there and get him or they would die too. But the priest could only go in God's presence one time a year. Could you imagine the kind of life you would have if you could only have access to God one time a year? I got to see. I, 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 I'm struggling now with just service on a Sunday and a Wednesday. But if you tell me I got to reduce my time with God to just one time a year, are you crazy? I love him too much to talk to him just one time. I need him too much to just pray one time. I, I, I don't. Let, 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 let me be nice. Your relationship with him may work like that. But I don't want, I don't know a woman nowhere that, don't, that wants a man to just talk to her one time a year and, and then still claim her. And if a woman won't take it, then God won't take it. And I wonder if anybody in here says, Lord, I need thee every hour. I need it. not another second, not another minute, but Lord, walk with me and talk with me and tell me I'm yours. You say that you love them, then why do you call them only when you need them? God is not a genie in a bottle, but he's a God in heaven. Says a royal priest. So if I'm a priest, that means I got access to God, but only once a year. But it says you're not just a priest. It says you're a certain kind of priest. What kind? A royal priest. Why is, it, why is it saying we're royalty? Because the chief privilege of a king is they can make a decree in the nation. And whatever the king decrees must be. And I know we often say we decree and we declare. But you only can declare what's already been decreed by the king. And if we're royal priesthood, then that means now we're part of the kingly lineage of God. Which now, and then it says in Romans chapter 8, now are we the sons of God, and if sons, heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And if Christ is the king, 
then I got king privileges. That's it. Uh oh. I get ready to help myself. Because that means if the king's privilege is to decrease something, and then that's what the new rule is, then that means I got the ability now, because I'm a royal priest, to change the rules by speaking a thing. Ah, uh, life and death is in the power. That means that if the rule was I only had access to God once a year, since I'm a royal priest, I can change that rule. And I can say, any time I want to have access to him, all I got to do is praise him. Because the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. You want to know what God's address is? One, two, three, hallelujah, boulevard. Whenever you praise him, he inhabits the praises of his people. And I know there's a rumor going around churches that says when praises go up, blessings come down. But there ain't no scripture in your Bible that says that. I'm sorry to tell you. But there is a scripture that says he inhabits the praises of his people. So that means blessings don't come down. The blesser comes down. And when God comes in the room, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So when he comes, he brings his blessings. going downhill now chosen generation royal priesthood but then there's this 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 cute little word this little this little nice little word that nobody likes very a uh, uh, holy i'm sorry did i say a bad word cuz you can't say holy in church no more people get start getting mad people got to go to work when you say holy when you say holy People start walking out because nobody wants to be holy. Nobody wants to live a standard. Nobody wants to be different, but eternal lives matter. People who have eternal life, their life matters because they are the ones that make a difference in the earth. The reason why your school hasn't been shot up is because you got eternal life and you're there. The reason why your job that nobody went postal in there is because of you. Because of the glory that you carry in your temple is the reason why some folks are saved from judgment and they don't even know it. Don't think that the devil ain't trying to come where you live. He just ain't got permission from God to invade that territory because God says, I got to keep you safe. It says holy. Now holy lets me know that we got to be separated from some stuff. I'll leave you alone with this. Most of you know that many of our young men have a fascination with a pair of shoes out called Michael Jordan gym shoes. Yeah. Don't worry, fellas. I ain't going to get on you tonight. <laughs> but I remember when I was in high school, I started high school at 12 years old. And I had a fascination from peer pressure with everybody else that said, we wanted some Michael Jordan gym shoes. And I remember I said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go home and do some chores around the house to convince my mother to spend, back then, it was $159 on one pair of shoes. Crazy, ain't it? And so I said, I went home to my mother's and I went and did some dishes. And I went in and, and I vacuumed the living room. I took the trash out. Yeah. Stuff I normally don't do. She probably thought I caught a cold or something. <laughs> and then I went and I went and did the laundry, y'all. Yeah, I went and did some laundry. Mm. And I went and got the dirty clothes and I put them in the washing machine. Mm -hmm. And I poured in some detergent. No, I seen the cartoons. I knew not to put in too much. So I put in just a cup full, and by the time I got through, I went up to my mother. I heard her coming home. I said, Ma, uh, I got a question for you. She said, yes. I said, uh, well, first let me let you know I did the dishes. She said, oh, thank you. I said, oh, and let me also let you know that uh, 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 I took the trash out. She said, oh, thank you. I said, oh, and I, I, I washed the clothes, too. She said, thank you. 
thank you so much. What do you want? I said, well, since you're asking me, I said, I want some Michael Jordan gym shoes. She said, okay. You surely need shoes. And since you've been such a good boy doing extra work around the house, sure. She said, how much they cost? I said, uh, $159. She said, how much? I said, uh, $159. She said, would you quit playing? How much? I said, $159. She said, boy, you crazy? I can take you to Payless. You can get the whole men's department for $159. I said, Mom, but I want them real bad. She said, just this one time, and that's it. Don't ever ask me for nothing like this again. But Lord, have mercy, Jesus. She happened to go downstairs to change her clothes, and there was a problem. She went to the dryer machine. And I made a big mistake, fellas. When I went and got the dirty clothes, I put them in the washing machine, but I failed one step. I didn't sort them by the colors. So I had a red towel in there with her white blouse, and now that white blouse was a little off pink. And she said, John, get down here. Oh, Jesus, what did I do? She said, what did you do to my shirt? I said, I washed the clothes. She said, don't you know that you got to separate the colors before you put them in there? The whites have to go by themselves. They can't be mixed in. Otherwise, other colors will bleed and the dye will get on the whites. And I realized a very important lesson about the separation of things that are clean. That the Bible says we are a holy nation. And if you're going to be holy, then you got to realize you can't be attached to anything other than wise, those things that contaminate you. And I got to be willing to realize that he's washed me and made me white as snow. And when he cleansed me from all of that filth I've been delivered from, I can't be like a dumb dog and go back to the vomit that God delivered me from. And it's not that I'm being funny. I'm just being holy. And I want to maintain the holiness which God has given me. So if I cut you off, it's because I'm cutting God on. Because not only do we got to worry about the flu virus, but we got to worry about the sin virus. Because sin is contagious. Some things you don't even say until you get around certain people. Some things you don't even think until you get around certain people. That's why if you're going to sit on my row, you got to be a praiser or you got to scoot over a row. When people come to church and they sit next to me, I do a praise check. I say, Jesus. And if they sit there like this, I say, excuse me, this seat is reserved for a praiser. You got to go somewhere else. Because when I say Jesus, something ought to just happen in the atmosphere. When I say Jesus, your blood ought to boil. When I say Jesus, your fingers ought to tingle. When I say Jesus, your smile ought to show up. When I say Jesus, something ought to happen in your soul. Praise check, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noon 